Good morning, Nigeria. How is everyone today? Um, I am once again honored to have uh, Ben Murray Bruce with me today, just so we can talk about around the world. Hello, Ben. I think we're going to start with the U.S. presidential election, uh, go through that. Um, and, and, and I want to ask you a question, though, before we get started. You know, on your last yeah. segment, I was just watching the news there, and there's a gentleman on there, and the newscast was asking about getting ready for the next Nigeria presidential election. And I don't want to get into the weeds on that, but they were saying that that um, what they expect is that uh, more projects will be given to the people as we get closer to the election in Nigeria. Is that a common ploy in Nigeria, just out of curiosity, that elected officials will do more projects to try to, before the election, to entice the voters to support them? Yeah, I think everybody does that across the world. They're definitely, they're going to try to do as many projects as they can, try to commission as many projects as they can to prove to the electorate they've done a great job in the first four years of office to make sure to get the votes second time around. So I think, uh, yeah, that's what they do. Well, listen, I wish they would do that in the United States. I know you say they do it around the world, but, um, you know, uh, you know, so let, that's a good segue into what's going on because, you know, one of the biggest issues in the U.S. presidential election right now is the economy. You know, you know, because Trump is, you know, he has an actual record of when he was president to compare against the, the Biden administration. And one thing that's frustrating people in the election uh, on the Republican side is that Trump is not focused on that. I mean, he's not talking about the things he accomplished. And um, uh, and, and so instead, he's, he's waging personal attacks. He's talking about whether or not he should have his mic on during the debates and all this kind of stuff. Do you think that um, just I, I, these are random questions I'd like to ask you because I love your perspective. I mean, do you think that that, you know, knowing what you know about the United States and about, you know, Trump and uh, do you think it's a good strategy for him to to stay with his old style of attacking and make it personal? Or do you think he should really focus on the issues more? I think he should focus on the issues. But Trump is Trump. He, he got where he is today by being a nutcase. You know, insulting everybody, <laughs> criticizing people. That is how he got the power. And then he got used to a, a particular style of governance, a, a, a particular style of communicating with people. It worked for him in the past. And usually when things work for you 10 years ago, you think it worked for you 10 years later. You forget the world has changed. We've seen it. We're fascinated by what he did. Now it's time to move on. And I think he should change his strategy. But I got to say this. A lot of people across the world like strong president, like men who are tough, who are strong, who are crazy. That's what the world likes. If you look at the history of Nigeria, people like President Obasanjo, people like um, people like um, what was that General Cox. So, so, so we, we the world likes tough people. They like Kigami. Okay, they like Trump. So yes, it worked for him before. Maybe it will work for him one more time. You never know. Okay, well, I'm going to go. I mean, I promise I'll talk about the U.S. elections. But one quick question for you: Do you think Nigeria anytime soon will be ready for a female president? No. That's no. a straight answer. No, no, no. Well, I mean, that's I, what I would you know, like. I would like a female president, but I don't think you could sell it right now. It's uh, America wasn't ready uh, not long ago, and maybe you might be ready today. But that took you a very, very long time. So yeah, we're not ready for that right. now. Well, let's take that into I'm talk about what's ready. I'm personally, personally ready. ready. Yeah, oh, definitely. But I don't know if the people would, would, would want a female president. Well, I'm actually just curious. Once again, I love these questions. Has a woman ever run for president of Nigeria? Yes, several times. But they, oh, really? they never, I, never, I don't think they got a nomination of their parties. Different women have run. But I don't think they got a lot of votes either. Well, listen, they I were. think America, uh, let's talk about America. I think America is very close. Listen, if the election were held today, Kamala Harris would win. Okay, she would. Um, I mean, if you look at, you know, she's up 47, 45 in the national polls. But what, and I, I, what, what we always as Americans, we like to explain is that we don't go by the popular vote. We go by the electoral college. You yeah. know, it's a matter of how many uh, votes you get in the electoral college. And if you look at the key swing states right now, which are Michigan, Georgia, Nevada, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, um, other than Georgia, Nevada, Kamala is up in every one of those states. And so the reality is, is that she she would have enough electoral votes to win today. Now, one of the things I would say is that if she was a nominee six months ago or five months ago, she would not be where she is now. I think what she's riding high, especially after the Democratic convention, 
she's riding high on on just the novelty and then you know you don't have people who are oppressed when they're oppressed for so long that it's just some silver lining comes out they just flock toward that democrats were oppressed for a long time because they were just so disenfranchised or dis, dis uh disenchanted with with uh, joe biden that when she came out she's a, a breath of fresh air so that's what she's going through now i'm going to predict that I still think she's going to win, but I think it's going to be one of the closest elections we've ever had in the United States, um, uh, because I think the honeymoon period for her is over, and Trump is going to come out strong. So I don't know what you're thinking there in Nigeria about you know what's happening in the U.S. presidential election, but it's going to be close. Uh, the first debate is supposed to be September 10th. It's 50-50 whether that's going to happen or not, but I really do believe that it's, it's neck and neck. What, what's your thoughts there from Nigeria on the election? I think she's going to lose. You think she'll lose? Yeah. I, 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 let me tell you. I, I was in Georgia not long ago. And this is a couple of years ago. And I was, I was talking to a bunch of black guys, African Americans. And they said to me, they would never vote for a female president, regardless of party. I had, this is Georgia. Now, I, I had no idea being female was bad for politics but that's what he said to me and it made me think these guys were in their 70s and they would not vote for a female president and just talking to them made me realize two things that hillary lost maybe for that reason i don't know but he was white i believe five maybe ten percent of u.s voters who may be racist or maybe anti-feminist would not vote for her, regardless of her policies. And I don't think these numbers will show up in the polls. That's what I think. I can't prove it, but I think it's like Sunak. If 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 when Sunak ran in Great Britain, how many people voted against him because they didn't like his policies? Or how many people voted against him because he was Indian? How many people are going to vote against Kamala because she's female and not white, as opposed to her policies? Do you hate Trump badly enough to vote against him? Or would you say, hey, I would tolerate four more years of Trump until the right candidate shows up or until the old guys die off and we can have a free society and uh, people will vote based on the policies of the individuals and not the sex or the race. That's the issue for me. And I don't know. I don't know. I, I, my gut feeling tells me she's going to lose. I can't prove it, but that's what I think. Well, listen, it's interesting. I think that this, this election will have a lot to do with race. There's no doubt about it. We'll have a lot to do with gender. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, one of the big things that happened for Trump is that uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Bobby Kennedy's son, who was John F. Kennedy's brother, uh, came out and he suspended his independent campaign and came out and endorsed uh, Trump. And I think that will make a difference on the margins. I mean, it's just like what happened in the last elections there where you had, a, you know, the independent candidate uh running it's, it, it it will splinter the vote so i think that that's a big thing now what's really interesting is rfk jr his whole family kennedy's there were democrats um it's really upset the democrats that he's basically forsaken his family's name but but i think that on the margins is going to make a difference so it's going to be close and i is america ready for a female president but you know it's, it's deeper than that it's, you know, it, it's a two question is america ready for a female president are they ready for a black female president you know and um I mean, that's, you know, I know we've already had a black president in the United States, but, you know, uh, there is, listen, as you know, racism is alive and well in the United States. Um, sexism is alive and well in the United States. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons she chose, she chose not to uh, do Governor Shapiro of Pennsylvania as her running mate is because he was Jewish and just didn't want that mm -hmm. additional, additional issue. So, uh, listen, I think that this will, will be one of the most fascinating elections we've seen in the United States. Um, hey, real quick. So, what, I love watching these promos you guys do. So you just had a promo on cholera. Okay, so cholera yeah. is a big issue there. Now, it made me think, and I think I sent this to you yesterday, is that the United Kingdom uh, has issued a travel ban for British citizens going to Nigeria. 
um, uh, and the whole world, especially Spain, is getting to be a, an issue, but because about monkeypox. Now, they call it mpox now. They decided to do away with monkey. I'm not really sure why, but it's mpox. Just out of curiosity, do you do you see that as an issue there in Nigeria, mpox? Yes and no. I think it's a health issue. I think the authorities are handling it pretty well. Uh, there's a big campaign about what you can or sh shouldn't do. And I think we'll be okay. I think it's some of that will pass. I think the, the authorities are up to speed and the Ministry of Health, Fed and, 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 and State will make sure this doesn't spread and then it, it'll be resolved. Well, great. So do you think that you know, of all the things that happened with uh, COVID-19, do you think that that has helped countries like Nigeria and others be better prepared for issues like this when they happen? Yes, I, I, Ebola was, we had great success with Ebola. We had great success with COVID-19 and Mpox is going to be the same. I think Nigerians don't want to die and the authorities don't die. You see, it's one of those things where the authorities have no choice. If they don't fix the problem, they die too. It's not like the poor will die and the rich will live or the government officials will live and the poor will die. Everybody dies. So yeah, when things like this happen, government officials are quick to solve the problem. As long as they die too, that's the key. If they don't have a chance <laughs> to die, then that, that changes. Well, listen, I'm not advocating anybody die, so let's just see if we can get this all under control. You know, <laughs> definitely what's going on around the world. Oh, I guess yeah. around around the world, okay, but just to be very clear, those pictures they just show were not of my skin, so be very clear that that's not what I look like, <laughs> okay. okay? You know? <laughs> anyway, let's go to another topic. <laughs> You know, you know, people are asking what's going on in Ukraine. Like, what's up with Ukraine? Okay, once again, we can do away with those nasty pictures of my skin. There, okay, we can move on to to Ukraine now. But um, so, you know, a lot of people are asking um, uh, what's going on with Ukraine. You know, Ukraine actually invading Russia. Uh, was it a good idea, a bad idea? Uh, yesterday, I don't know if you heard, but you know, Russia sent a barrage of over 200, 250 missiles into Ukraine. Uh, trying to destroy their infrastructure. I mean, that's what they're focused on, destroying their infrastructure, getting ready for the winter months. So they're having a very difficult time. Um, but listen, if you were if you were either the Ukrainian president or the president of Russia, um, what what do you what do you think that you would be doing? Do you think it's a good idea that the Ukrainians invaded uh, uh, Russia and they actually, you know, are taking territory in Russia? That's what I think is a great idea. Great, great. It's a great move. I think Ukraine should annex part of Russia and make it part of Ukraine. That's what I would do. Annex it and make it part of Ukraine. Take as much territory from Russia as you can and make it part of Ukraine. If they took, I don't know, 20 square miles of, I don't, I don't know the size of Crimea, wherever it is, take this. And, and Russia is really not trying to stop the invasion. From what I've read, they're, they're, they're taking a lot of territory. They're not trying to stop the invasion. I read an article that said maybe Putin wants this to happen so he can mobilize Russians to be fully committed to this war because Russia, the, the general folks in Russia are not particularly excited about this war. So if he lets this happen and take a big slice of Russia, maybe the average Russian would be committed and he doesn't have to call for general mobilization and he can get maybe 200,000 more people to join the army and they could end this war on their terms. That's what I read and maybe that's how Putin is thinking. I can't think like a dictator. But let me ask you a question. You lived in Kiev. You married a Ukrainian. You had an apartment in Kiev. You were an advisor to Zelensky. What kind of guy is Zelensky? How does he think? You know, when I asked you, when we talked about Kamala, you said you knew Kamala and Trump. For me to understand policies of individuals, I'd like to know them. If I know them, if you ask me, what Obasanjo's foreign policy would be as president, I could tell you because I knew him. If you ask me what President Jonathan's foreign policy would be, I could tell you because I know him. You know Zelensky very, very well. You lived in the area. You predicted to me accurately that Russia would invade two years before the invasion. You tried to encourage me to buy an apartment in Kiev. You told me you could buy an apartment in Kiev for $30,000, which is incredibly cheap. Now you tell me, you know Zelensky well, you've worked with him, you're his advisor. Now, what is he thinking and what is he trying to accomplish? Well, that's a pretty complex question. I mean, for, you know, he, listen, Zelensky, there's two issues here. One is the, as, as with any country at war, there's a domestic issue and the foreign policy issue. Okay. You know, domestically, after two, over two years of war, 
uh, Ukrainians retired. You know, um, and what's interesting, I, not to go on the segue, I watched the documentary about Vietnam uh, that Ken Burns did. I uh, watched it over the weekend, and it got to the whole thing about the draft. And it talked about how the rich people, when the draft was coming, uh, they were trying to avoid the draft. People knew that as the war was grinding on, it was really a death machine and no one wanted to go. And that's the same thing you're seeing in Ukraine right now, is that after two years, the average person on the street who's of, of, um, of, of age to go serve the military is seeing that it's, it's, it's a meat grinder. Okay, people are dying. Uh, you're not making, uh, you know, you're not making advances. So you're seeing the same thing happening in Ukraine as you saw in the United States during Vietnam, where people are doing everything they can do to avoid the draft. They're paying people. They're saying they're sick. They're trying to leave the country. I mean, there's a whole host of issues going on. So Zelensky's trying to find ways to re-encourage the average Ukrainian to say, listen, this is not a lost war. We have the opportunity to win it. Um, and so, you know, his mind is, you know, we have to do something to keep public opinion up because like you saw in Vietnam and you've seen the wars around the world is that if the public loses support for the war, you will not win the war. It just won't happen. And so he's trying everything he can do to build that support. And so by proactively invading Russia, he's showing uh, Ukrainians that, hey, we can win this war. We take it to them. We can punish the Russians. Now, on the, uh, so everyone most of the people in Ukraine are very excited about this. They say that, you know, they still think it's going to be a tough war, but they say, okay, well, Russia's vulnerable because we can beat Russia. So that's why he did it. You know, people talk about, well, it's strategic that it will allow him more of an opportunity to negotiate a settlement. Um, and that may be true to some degree, but I really do believe that his reason for doing it was, was public opinion uh, uh, domestically. Now, internationally, I think it's also showing that, okay, the, the military is not dead. The military can, can continue. And what's interesting is that no country in the world, the United States, the Brits, the Germans, are not saying, oh, don't do it. Because as you know, early in the war, they were saying, we don't want this incursion into Russia. We don't want to give you weapons that will actually be able to attack Russia. So the whole concept and thought from the foreign, uh, from the foreign international community to support Russia is really there. Now, the last thing I'll say on that is that one of the benefits to Biden not running for president uh, and being the candidate is that behind the scenes, he is actively doing everything he can do to provide greater support for Ukraine. Um, but it's going to, and, and, and listen, they also have to get as much territory as they can before the winter months, because in the winter months in, in the war, you can't do anything because the winters are so brutal that the war will come to a standstill. So, so Ukraine will do everything they do to gain as much territory as they can. The Russians will get as much territory as they can. We'll see the winter months. And I think that if there's any chance of diplomacy, it will happen during the winter months. So there's my thoughts on that. Um, I, 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 I agree with you. I think, I also think a settlement is in sight. I think Putin must know it's an unwinnable war and it makes no sense really. And, and, and I, I really believe in the next six to 12 months, there has to be a settlement. He can't win this war and you, uh, Zelensky can't lose this war. Uh, now, let me ask you this question. If Trump becomes president, would he force a deal? Because it looks like he's gonna be president. He's gonna force a deal. What's your thoughts? Well, I think that, you know, once again, it's interesting as well. You know, one thing in the Vietnam documentary that I was watching, it showed that uh, when the United States was privately negotiating, Henry Kissinger was negotiating with North Koreans and they reached a settlement. They did not tell the president of South Korea what the settlement was. So they were, they were doing it without his input. And, and, and that's one of the big issues is that when you talk about America settling the war, listen, you know, what I think one of the greatest mistakes that could happen is if America and Russia negotiated a settlement without Zelensky being involved. Uh, because it's, it, you know, Zelensky is a much more powerful president than the president of South Korea was. So I think that uh, we'll, listen, I think Trump will try to find, if he, if he wins presidency, he's going to try to find the quickest win internationally he can uh, to show that he can do what he says he's going to do. Uh, and I think that he will try to force a settlement uh, for the Ukrainian war. Um, and if he has a Republican majority in Congress, he will get the ability to lessen sanctions and cut a deal. Now, whether the Zelensky will go along with it, we'll have to see because, you know, unlike once again, I hate to keep going back to the Vietnam War, but unlike the Vietnam War, where really there was only five countries uh, involved in Vietnam, you know, and none of them were like the UK and the French. It was like lesser countries. The thing with the United with, with the war in Russia is that you have 
you have uh, the UK involved, you have France involved, you have the NATO involved, you have all these international countries involved. And so it would be very difficult for a unilateral peace de decision to be made without in 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 including all of those. So, yeah, but, but, but you know NATO will follow the lead of America. Britain will follow the lead of America. It's very unlikely that Britain and Germany would be on opposite sides of the United States. No matter what they say, ultimately, mili militarily, they will follow the lead of America. And, and if Trump says no, he's the greatest funder of NATO anyway in the United States, I, I don't see how the rest of Europe would support Zelensky. And I don't see how militarily Zelensky will survive 12 months with Russia and Chinese onslaught. So I, I think ultimately he'll capitulate. I mean, maybe. I mean, you know, the relationship, as you know, between Trump and NATO is very, um, is, is very difficult. You know, there's a new NATO leader uh, who is really more pro-Ukraine uh, than has been in the past. Uh, so it's gonna be very, very, very difficult. And um, and but but the other thing is Zelensky. You know, you're gonna have to convince Zelensky to literally give up Russian land. I mean, so, you know, another thing is that people could argue that one of the reasons he he invaded Russia is to make it more difficult for people to unilaterally decide what his country is going to do. Because once again, Ukrainian soldiers occupy Russia. So even if they reach a deal, I mean, that means he has to decide to pull those troops back. Now, will he do it? Who knows? So it's gonna be a very complicated mess. I do think it's interesting you mentioned China. Uh, you know, I do believe that China is going to um, uh, is going to be the broker in the deal. I think that they're going to be the ones who are very big at uh, um, at trying to find a solution. You know, we, so we're just talking about China. So it's a good segue into one of the other things I want to talk about is uh, China's influence in Africa. You know, we talk about Russia's influence in Africa, and one thing I was going to say is that you know Russia is doing more, like even there in Nigeria. Uh, to have greater influence, and many people argue that's because they want to use their influence in parts of Africa, especially in countries like Nigeria, as part of the bargaining process when it comes to the to the uh, finding the resolution to the Ukraine war. Putting that aside for a second, um, on uh, on China, China on September four through six is holding their uh, global forum on Africa relations. Uh, they're inviting all the African nations to Beijing to talk about it. Um, you know, let me ask you this. So you, you don't see the Americas doing that. You don't see the United States having a global summit on on African affairs. Um, do you think that that really makes a difference that, that China is hoarding the African nations like they are? Do you see that that really inspires African leaders to be more involved? Or what, what's your take on that? Listen, listen, Africa is the next frontier. America's economy is collapsing. You, 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 you ride on the streets of America, your bridges are falling down, you have potholes on, on your roads. You don't spend any money on the infrastructure of the United States. And I think Trump said that when he ran for president the other time. You go to China, it's an incredibly developed economy and it's moving very, very fast. But America has the greatest military known to man, the greatest fighting machine known to man. All your money is spent on military and space programs and things like that. China spends their money on trade. America, I think, has to make a decision. You want to keep fighting wars, America fights a war everywhere in the world except in America. Right? America, there's nobody invades America. America has never been invaded. Nobody bothers America. But they fight wars everywhere else. Then you have your human rights policy. America. And Africa cannot be judged in the same way you judge the United States of America or Western Europe, where right? we're developed economies. We're going to, it's going to take a while for us to get to where you are in terms of democracy, human rights, and things like that. We want it, but it's going to take a while. It's a cultural problem. Now, China is involved in trade. They just care about trade. They don't care if you kill all the Africans. They don't care what you do to your people. They don't care if you pollute all the rivers. They don't care what you do just make some money and they are fine. Also, they need an outlet for their massive, massive industrial production. America has to decide. You want to keep fighting wars or you want trade? You want to keep blowing up countries or you want investment? I don't think America can do both. They can do one or the other. But as long as there's a vacuum in Africa, somebody will fill that vacuum. It could be Russia, it could be China, or somebody else, but somebody will fill the vacuum. And I think it's time 
for America to take a decision and call an Africa-America summit to discuss trade and the economy. You can't have an African summit and all you're interested in selling AK, uh, selling guns, AK-47 that American M16s and jet F F-16 jet fighters and bombs. Nobody wants to fight in Africa anymore. We're tired. We want trade. We want development. We want to raise the standard of living for African countries. And China is providing that. Now, we can criticize China for providing that because America is not. The EU is not. So African leaders will gravitate towards China because they give us what we want. You want to build a great rail line? The French will not give you the facilities to do it. The Germans will not give you the facilities. The Americans will not give you the facilities. The Chinese will. And if you're an African leader and you have a choice, you will gravitate towards China. Not because you like them, but because you have no choice. And I think America is failing in their foreign policy in not understanding Africa. And I said this to you on the last show. Look, the reason why America is so insulated, and, and, and I said this a comedian, Bill Cosby said this many, many years ago. He said a European travels for 30 minutes, he's in a different country speaking a different language. He sees a different culture. You're in Spain, you travel two hours, you're in Africa. In America, you can travel for five days, five days, you see the same people, the same cities, you're in the same country, and you're content with the United States of America. And as long as you're content with your country, you're insulated. And I think most Americans don't even know where Africa is, including African Americans. And I think that has to change. Your educational system has to change the way Americans see the world. It's not about blowing up bridges and killing people. You've got to see the world in terms of trade and development. If that changes, America will play a bigger role in Africa, and we will stop all these wars. But as long as all you're doing is having the greatest military machine known to man, and China is focusing on trade, this will never stop. There's a vacuum. America doesn't want to fill the vacuum or doesn't know how to fill the vacuum, and the Chinese are taking advantage of that. I think you're 100% spot on. I think that America has taken, I know we only got a minute here, but you know, America has to make a decision as a country. You know, are we going to be a country that, that believes that we are the protector of democracy and freedom around the world? Or are we going to be a country that, that wants to help um, fill the vacuums, as you said, from an economic standpoint and grow our economy and grow other countries' yeah. economy? Um, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a fundamental change in, that America has to make. And by the way, driving five hours across America and not hearing different things. Listen, you go to Georgia, as you know, you hear something different than you hear in New York. So you guys speak funny down in Georgia. So I got to say that. <laughs> uh, listen, it's uh, sadly, as always, you run out of time. We may oh, have yeah. to talk to the uh, chairman of Silverbird at some point about extending the oh, length of the yeah. show. <laughs> we may have to try to do that. But anyway, thanks a lot. Um, anyway, Nigeria, thank you for all your time. I appreciate it. Next week, we're going to have Joe Matthews uh, on the show. And Ben, I'm going to have you as well, if you're around, just to talk about America, U.S. Who's politics Joe, who's more in Joe, depth. Who's, who? Joe, who's Joe, Joe, is a, Joe is a Democratic uh, strategist. He's a, he's a former writer for the Los Angeles Times. Uh, his wife is a, is, a, is a writer for the, for the Wall Street Journal. Um, he really, you know, he's very close to Arnold Schwarzenegger in California politics. He knows what's going on around the world. So, especially when at, at I want, I want, I want, I want a Trump guy on the show too. Get me, get me one of the Trump guys. I know, I know, I know. You know the time difference. You know, listen, Trump, Trump people are lazy. They don't want to get up at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> to be on this show. You know, is that I got to say? So, anyway, we're okay. working on it. But anyway, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks Nigeria, and we'll talk again next week. Talk to you later. Take Goodbye. Care. Take care.